Hey, I'm Rob Berger. When I'm not rolling in the dough, that's right, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. lunchtime money nerds i'm joe's mom's neighbor doug and today's show ain't no baloney because we've slapped together len penzo's annual school lunch sandwich survey so let me tell you about it len penzo's hammed up a study of the cost of bread meats and even added in some cheese are prices higher or lower than last year where are the bargains better yet how's the dough inflating and sandwiched in between today's open and lend, we'll catch up with a buzz about stocks from social media. Joining us for his monthly update, we welcome from Buzz Index, Jamie Wise. And that's not all, Turkey, because today we will have all of Mom's other podcast fixins like the Haven Lifeline, your letters, and of course, my trivia. Now, here's two guys who always bully the poor sandwich artist into giving them extra olives. Joe and oh, j j j j g. I'm a big fan of the olive. I like olives. I don't do the blue cheese ones. Oh, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Do you bully the dude at Subway? You're like, hey man, come on. I have a funny story about a uh, Subway. That I can tell a little bit later. Maybe. Hey, everybody. I am Joe Saul C. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And today, across the card table from me on Sandwich Day, this is like a national holiday here when Len Penzo comes down and talks about the sandwich survey, isn't it? I like a good I like a good sandwich, right? Yes. And it's hard to find a good one. Like Panera used to have good sandwiches and they kind of got a little institutionalized, I think. And now they're, you know, a little more cost conscious than they need to be. Cutting some in corners. In my opinion cutting some corners and that voice across the card table is the surly on a wednesday oh gee you're halfway through your week you should be happy man i should be but uh, you know it's wednesday so there's always a reason to be down but you know it's- <laughs> <laughs> i'm not always surly I'm, I'm much less surly these days than i used to be that is true you gotta you give d- me some you gotta give me some love you know what will make you a lot lesser surly, OG, is Sur- surlier surly, less non-surly, more non-surly, S? More non-surliness is. You know, two of the most frequent questions we get on the show are, of course, about diversification and passive income. But how less surly would you be if you could find an investment that combined both real estate? Have you ever heard of Roofstock? Roofstock's online marketplace makes it easier than ever to buy, sell, and best of all, own tenant-occupied investment properties in top rental markets across the country. Whether it's your first time or your seasoned pro, all of Roofstock's certified properties are inspected in person so you know they're in good condition and have reliable tenants in place. And you can start earning monthly rental income right away. I I don't think I said earning, right? Yeah. Did I say earning? Earning, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what earning is. It sounds like... Earning early, I think is what you're trying to say. You've never heard about earning uh, monthly income? Yes. It's a whole it's a, whole different, it's a sport. It's a, it's a sport up in, yeah, we were both going there, right? <laughs> it's a sport up in like Iceland or something. It's one of those crazy sports. They wear lots of spandex, so I don't watch it. <laughs> uh they're in good condition. Anyway, I you, pictured can, them in kilts. you can start earning monthly rental income right away. Roofstock even connects you with vetted local property managers so you can separate investing from operations. And best of all, Roofstock certified properties are backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. Roofstock property investing made simple. Visit stackybenjamins.com forward slash Roofstock to learn more about rental home investing and browse exclusive listings today. That's stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Roofstock. Great way to get into real estate. In fact, Alex... Uh, who is at 50weekvacation.com. He, um, he he wrote a great review of Roofstock and how it works. And if you're a member of our closed Facebook group, The Basement, you uh, you maybe have read it. So Stacky Benjamin. My, my question is if you're on vacation for 50 weeks, I mean, you can't finish the last chapter of the book? <laughs> oh, come on, dude. You got two to go. <laughs> I, mean, I mean. Close the damn deal, Alex. Close the deal, dude. Right. right. Well, you know what? He needs an extra $450 in his pocket, OG, to do that. You know how he does that? He heads to magnifymoney.com. Because when you go to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, you're going to find out that that savings account you've got, not so great. The checking account could be better. Maybe those credit cards 
probably leaving some money on the table because you're not getting all the rewards you can if you pay them off every month. Or if you don't pay them off every month, you're not cutting the interest rate on those cards. So you're paying the man less money and paying them up quicker. That's what you got to do. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash magnify money is the place where 92% of all of the stuff online is rated against each other in a very easy to follow format. So uh, check that out. It's, it's funny how people will probably hear magnify money over and over on this show and they still won't have the right checking or the right savings account. And I know you, you're driving down the street right now going, yeah, I'll get on that later. Don't wait for later, man. Do it now. Do it now. While you're driving on the highway. Speak, d- don't do it now. Wait <laughs> until you get to the place <laughs> you, you go. Wait. Then do it. Right. Speaking of do, we got Len Penzo here. Len's in the house with his mm, annual sandwich survey. I love this show. This is one of my favorites. But first, we got some headlines, so let's go. Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins Headlines. First headline comes to us from Forbes.com. This is such a a cool article. Business booms in small towns across America thanks to total solar eclipse. Of course, this is coming. 35% of the houses listed for the night of the eclipse will be hosting for the first time ever. Uh, Since the total solar eclipse is occurring in non-touristic towns across America, the hospitality infrastructure is limited. This is where people, this is, you know, we talk sometimes about making more money. This is a cool way to make money, OG. Across America, business is booming in small towns. This written by Alexandra Talti. As tourists book their total solar eclipse travel plans for August 21st. For homeowners located in 65-mile path of totality stretching from Oregon to South Carolina, the potential for profits is huge. First-time users are turning to house-sharing websites like Airbnb and HomeAway to make some cash on their pad for the once-in-a-lifetime astronomical event. Do you remember the last solar eclipse? I don't. You don't remember it? I, I remember I was in like early high school, and it wasn't... Um... I don't think it was a total eclipse, but, you know, it was good enough that it was we had a special thing to do, you know, out yeah. in the football field or whatever. Yeah. People. But this like is going to be cool in a couple of weeks. I'm yeah. looking forward to it. I just hope it's the weather's good. Yeah. I did. Oh, wouldn't that stink? To have they have it. Well, they have a new one. They, they have a new one and they have a new like an updated version of the solar eclipse wow. coming too. <laughs> solar eclipse 2.0. <laughs> the um, uh, there's a website that you can go to that like you put in your city and it tells you exactly like what time and what the eclipse is going to look like. Oh, it's like awesome. time and date dot com or something. Yeah. But in our town, we have this one and then we have two more in the 2020s, like full totality ones in our town. And then nothing again to like 2100 for forever. Right. For yeah, 80 years or something. So. Yeah. But I love this idea of, of thinking about, oh, wait a minute. My house is in a spot where this thing's going to happen. I'm going to use Airbnb and make a little it's to- great idea of making cash. Like people it's don't like th- when somebody's uh, hosting players for a golf tournament. You know, there's a yeah. pro golf tournament in town or something like that. Yeah, but even you, but, but, but even you know, my house is along I thirty on the highway, of course. And so you think, well, if people are heading from point A to point B, even headed to that golf tournament, you could advertise that, hey, my house is on the way. If you get a late start and you want to stop, you know, I've got these bedrooms that used to be for Nick and Autumn. Could use those. Just some fantastic ideas. Love it. The only total eclipse of the sun that I'll be able to see, said Jesse Levitsky, a 29-year-old lawyer from Brooklyn. This is literally a -a once-in-a-lifetime event. Levitsky is traveling to St. Louis for August 21st. I don't think we'd be able to do this if we couldn't find an apartment there. For the night of August 20th, Airbnb has over 31,000 arrivals booked. Over a year ago, they only had 11,000 guests. Hmm. Yeah, Kansas. I think Missouri. this person up in Brooklyn needs to use the internet and find out that there's solar eclipses every year, multiple times throughout the world. You just yeah, but not like this. This is the big boy. This is the total. No, there's total solar eclipses every year. Just not in the U.S. You have to go to like Antarctica or right Sudan or whatever. you got to do the do do the math. Uh, figure out where that is. Do the math. I don't think that there's a lot of people that can do the math. <laughs> Look what the solar eclipse is going to be. <laughs> We're gonna sit down with your slide rule in your astronomical charts from Galileo and try to decide when the next one is like, well, based on my calculations, <laughs> the next one will be in Corpus Christi, Texas. I think I think we should head there in June. You don't sit down with a <laughs> sundial in your backyard. Come on. Come on. Damn, I was off by 100 miles. 
the real solar eclipses in Monterey, Mexico. Damn it. If there's only some technology that would predict this to the exact minute and second. If only we had that. And in our second headline, we go back and take a look at the buzz around social media landscape. And you know what that means? Jamie Wise from the Buzz Index joins us. Welcome back, man. Hey, it's great to be here, Joe. How are you today? Well, I'm fantastic, especially since I was just reading. There's been a lot of chatter about biotech lately, huh? A lot of chatter about everything lately. I I don't know if we forgot to tell the investment world that it's summer, and usually these are the dog days of summer, but it's been really busy in online communities over the summer. A lot of conversation and a lot of conversation in the biotech space specifically. And we really noticed it this past month in Buzz where we had a significant increase in the allocation to the biotech sector going up to 21% from 15% the month before. It's, it's such an exciting area. And I know that you guys have had a fairly static amount of biotech. So maybe maybe that means now's the time. Yeah, you know what? For a year or so now, biotech companies really haven't been doing all that much. We had a dip down before the election, but since then they sort of quickly retraced once Trump got in and they've been, you know, if we look at the IBB as a proxy, the IBB ETF as a proxy for where biotech companies are trading, really from November straight through to June or about the middle of June, they kind of were range bound sitting around, you know, the $300 mark on the index of the ETF. And I think people were trying to really figure out what policy implications might happen for the shares. Would Congress take an aggressive stance against the pricing practices? It it was just really wait and see mode. And I think as time's gone by, these companies are still delivering. There's still value. There's still exciting things happening in the space. And we finally saw that breakout to the upside in the trading range of biotech shares. and, And it really was confirmed on sentiment. People are getting excited about biotech companies once again. Well, when you say going back to the fact that there's a lot of chatter, Jamie, are people mostly, is that positive chatter mostly, or is it positive and negative, mostly negative? Yeah, well, in biotech, we're certainly seeing much more positive Positive, chatter than we've seen recently. But overall, there has been a significant increase in the past few months in the amount of conversation generally that's happening around stocks online and all sorts of different forums. And the conversation, as you would expect, is a broad range. Some of it's positive, some of it's negative, some of it's somewhere in between. But what's exciting for us is that there is more conversation happening online. People continue to go to online platforms, to listen to shows like yours, to engage with their fellow investors and talk about investments and what makes sense for them and their portfolios. And of course, for us, selfishly, more data is better because we get better insights into more companies, which gives us the opportunity to find hidden gems within all that data. Well, the data for you guys has been great lately. I know uh, the S&P was up 1.9%. Nice month for the S&P 500, but you guys were at 3.1%. So all this data means good stuff for the for the buzz index. Netflix is a company that yesterday I was reading this report about more. You know, it, it was funny. It was a weird article, Jamie. It was kind of negative saying that Netflix with some of these new shows, Stranger Things season two coming out soon. I'm excited about that. But they're going to be bleeding cash over the short run, which I think would be a real negative on the stock. Yet if you read further into the piece, it said that, well, that's just the nature of of business over the short run. So people shouldn't get too worried. What do you think about Netflix? God, what an interesting stock Netflix is. It's one of those that, you know, maybe a value investors just love to hate this stock, right? And they're always looking for an angle, I find, in the traditional media to tell investors why to be afraid of Netflix. But what we hear is something completely different. And, and basically, investors aren't buying that. People really like this company. They like the growth prospects. Obviously, we saw that in the most recent quarter where global subscriber growth and global subscribers for the first time ever now exceed domestic U.S. subscribers. A very big deal. The stock had a huge move up, I think at least a 10% move up on that news. The sentiment behind Netflix is strong. It, It ebbs and flows. We had it in the buzz index going into earnings benefited from that nice move, rebalanced the index in July, even after people thought that move or some of the experts, so-called experts, questioned the velocity of the move, it stays in the index. And I think it's a classic case of the momentum is strongly behind that name. And that's really what we're identifying at Buzz. Where's that long-term momentum from a sentiment perspective? 
people like the stock, people like the story. There's bumps along the road. There's naysayers that come up and maybe have a louder microphone than you or I when they're trying to voice their opinion. But the collective really doesn't buy it. They look through it and they continue to own it. Yeah, but betting against Netflix long term has been horrible for anybody who's done that. I just remember over the course of my career, so many times people bet against Netflix and <laughs> look at look at where they are now. I have right. I have one more question for you. We had a great discussion in the basement, which is our closed Facebook group for uh, Stacking Benjamins. By the way, if anybody wants to be a part of that. Uh, conversation. It's stackingbenjamins.com forward slash basement. And that'll take you to the link to, to join us there. But we were talking about the buzz index, Jamie, and about the amount of turnover that you guys have from month to month, obviously, as the buzz changes. And so there were some people that were worried about capital gains. I even was worried about capital gains. We reached out to you, but with exchange traded funds, moving stuff in and out of the index doesn't necessarily create a taxable event. Can you explain that? Yes, ETFs are probably the most efficient tax investment vehicle on the planet. And the big reason on why that is, and, and that's much more so than a traditional mutual fund, which has to buy and sell stocks as people subscribe and redeem to the mutual fund, and they create capital gains by doing that, by buying and selling funds. ETFs have this wonderful mechanism that's called in-kind creation and redemption. It means that when someone subscribes or new shares are created with an ETF, they don't have to buy the stocks in the market. And when they sell it, they don't have to sell those stocks in the market. They don't have to generate capital gains. They can flow through the shares to the authorized participants, the big broker dealers and the banks who are creating the shares on behalf of their clients, what's called in-kind. So they actually deliver the underlying holdings of the ETF. And by doing so, they pass through the tax effects and the tax consequences of those holdings. So the ETF, what's left in the ETF is even if the names within the portfolio are turning over, because of the in-kind redemption and creation feature, they're able to really maximize the efficiency of the ETF, minimize the capital gains that would accrue naturally within the fund and deliver something to investors that's really tax efficient. So it's a, it's a unique mechanism. It's not unique to Buzz. It's unique to the yeah. structure of the ETF. And it makes it one of the most tax efficient holdings out in the market, almost regardless of turnover within the ETF. It's really interesting. So it, it doesn't matter if it's you or it's the S&P 500 or whatever it is, it's going to be much more tax efficient. You would rather own those products in ETF form than in a mutual fund form, for example. Absolutely. Nice. Well, if people want more on the Buzz Index, it trades under ticker symbol BUZ. And you can also find out more at stackingbenjamins.com forward slash BUZZ. Jamie Wise, thanks for hanging out with us, man. Great to be here. Enjoy the next couple of weeks of summer because we know up here in Canada, it fades fast. <laughs> I know. Isn't that sad? By the way, I, I need to do my disclaimer, which is that I own shares in the Buzz Index. And obviously that doesn't mean that you should do your own homework, but I'm enjoying uh, the ride so far, Jamie. Thanks again. Hey, great talking to you. Thanks, Travis. See you next time. Big thanks again to Jamie for stopping by. The buzz on biotech, very interesting. Biotech back in the news after being... Uh, Kind of quiet for a long time. Can't wait Dead to see in the water what, for a while, huh? Yeah, can't wait to see what happens there, and can't wait to see the solar eclipse. What a Mrs. money! O, Mrs. OG says she sees the total eclipse of my heart all the time. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it was so bad. It was so bad. <laughs> and the worst part was, I was you gonna, had nothing to say. You were like. <laughs> the, the worst part was I was no. The worst part was I was going to make that joke earlier, and it was so stupid that I backed off. And you You're just like, wait it out, wait it out. Yeah, OG will take care of this one for me. One of my favorite ways to talk about inflation is to actually look at the price of something. And award-winning blogger Len Penzo has picked the lock on this. OG, he is of course the host of LenPenzo.com, an offbeat blog for intelligent people. A uh, very, very humorous blog that he has. And he always finds a great way to talk about these things that people don't think about, like inflation, like we're going to talk about today in a way that's understandable. With school coming, he's got his back to school survey of the cost of a sandwich. And so whether you're packing a sandwich for lunch at work or packing it for kids to go back to school or you to go to school, Len's got us covered today. Let's talk about the cost of a sandwich and Len Penzo's annual sandwich survey.
And joining us back in the basement, Len Penzo. Man, welcome back. Joe, how are you today, sir? Dude, it's like you and I never talk. I know, we never talk. It's, <laughs> it's just uh, one of these days we're going to have to get together and have a little conversation. But it is weird that we're talking on a Wednesday and not a Friday, and that Paul is not here and Greg's not here. So that is that is different. <laughs> that is different. Yes, it is. I'm not, you know, this is a... Uh, you take him away from the boss man today, so uh, I'm, I've snuck out, and hopefully uh, nobody – he's not listening in. That's good. Nobody listens to the show, you know, so, so we're good. We're, we're fine. So let's talk about this. For people that aren't long-time – long-time listeners know exactly where we're going with the sandwich survey. One knows that uh, accused you and I of borderline child abuse for advocating that we send kids to school with a cheese sandwich. We didn't yes, have the- and, le- and let me say this, Joe, in honor of that complaint this year, I put the grilled cheese sandwich on the uh, as the supporting <laughs> photo for the survey. <laughs> Absolutely. We want to. Did you notice that? Joe? Did you see that grilled cheese sandwich? Somewhere? We want to dignify that response. <laughs> Absolutely. You want to hate the show? You're going to hate it even more now. Let's talk about let's talk about what it's competing against, because you have a problem with the school lunch program just in general. Yeah, I mean, have you seen what they give you for lunch? Never mind what the price is. It's just terrible. The, the food is really bad. You don't get a lot of it, and it's not very appetizing. But then you throw in the fact that, hey, it's still three bucks, and at least that's what it is this year. Or my, my daughter who just graduated, I guess my kids don't go to school anymore. I'm getting old. But even three bucks, hey, that adds up, Joe, over the course of a 180-day school year. That's uh, 1080 bucks for two kids. Right. But it isn't just that that's the issue. It's also the inflation on that school lunch over last year is big. You said in your piece, that's a, that's a big, fat inflationary number. Yeah. You know what? It's a little ironic considering the results of my survey this year. But yeah, the school lunch went up 9% over the previous year. But if you look at the sandwiches, the price of sandwiches came down about 6%. So, so try and reconcile that. I have no idea how that, how to explain that. That, that. I guess, I guess if I did have to explain it, the lunch is held steady at school for two years prior. So maybe they're okay. trying to catch up. Yeah, right. We're going to have a spoiler alert here. The findings the findings are that bringing your lunch became a more profitable thing before. And like you said, healthier Well, the price of the unsatisfying lunch actually went the opposite direction. So let's set up the survey. What are the different sandwiches that you compare? Okay. It's the same 10 sandwiches every year. Bologna, PB&J, American cheese, which uh, for the complainers out there, it could be the grilled cheese sandwich, okay? Grilled cheese, if that makes you feel any better. Egg salad sandwiches. There's tuna, turkey and Swiss, salami. Uh, ham and Swiss, roast beef and cheddar, and the king of all sandwiches, the BLT. You know, I had a BLT just this last weekend, and I hadn't had one forever. You forget how damn good that sandwich is. Oh, in the summertime especially. I mean, we here at home too, the honeybee and I, at least twice a month, we'll make uh, BLTs for dinner. And it's just, uh, it's really good. Oh, dude, I'm with you. I had, I had uh, tomatoes that I'd gotten from the farmer's market. And so there were just these delicious tomatoes, not the store-bought ones that taste like nothing. Yeah. Just amazing. It was so good. Of course. Hey, I'm getting hungry. Let's go. I know. Let's, let's, let's move this on. All right. So, (laughs) so let's talk about the different sandwiches. What do you think was the most surprising about the sandwich moves? Well, the fact that they dropped this year, again, 6%. What's interesting is Tuna and turkey and Swiss are on a, well, especially turkey and Swiss, the price of turkey and Swiss has been dropping now for three consecutive years. So very interesting. And and, uh, one year it was because of uh, the price of turkey dropping. And in another year, it was because of the price of cheese. But the price of a turkey and Swiss sandwich is almost half the price it was a couple of years ago. That's that's amazing. So yeah. there's there's a bargain there. And on the tuna side, why is tuna dropping 39%? Why is that? It's basically the price of tuna, Joe. Okay. Uh, the price of tuna itself dropped 42% this year from last year based on my survey. And 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 just for the readers I, I or the listeners out there, you know, you're probably saying, oh, Penzo, this is a very unscientific survey. No, it's a really, it's a quite a scientific survey. I have been going to the same store around the same time every year, always looking at the cheapest items on a cost per serving basis. So I am I am looking up and down the aisles to find the absolute cheapest ingredients I can find always. 
But yes, this time the price of tuna dropped 42 percent, which was huge. So those two sandwiches were great, but you did have some sandwiches that went in the wrong direction where this year it's going to cost a little more to uh, send your kid to school with these. Yeah, roast beef and cheddar, the two most expensive uh, sandwiches year in and year out, not surprisingly, are roast beef and cheddar and the bacon, lettuce and tomato sandwich. They both rose, risen, the price climbed about 10 to 13 percent, depending on the sandwich this year. But if you look at it overall in a dollars and cents perspective, Joe, it's it's really not that much. The BLT climbed, I think it was 27 cents from last year. I mean, that's really not yeah. too bad. No, I think I think it's B roast, by the way. B roast? Well, you were going risen, roast, like you were struggling with that. It was be roast. Yeah. <laughs> the price be roast. Uh, okay. Oh, I get you. Yeah, yeah. it'd be roast all right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The price be roast. Uh, all right. That's a joke that just completely <laughs> failed, like every other joke we have on this show. Uh, this shows you how, how confused I was. Okay, go ahead. The cheapest sandwich right now is the same sandwich that's been the least expensive year after year, right? It's been the same? Well, the last five years, yes. Okay. Bologna sandwich. And again, I bring this up all the time with my readers, people, I don't know what it is. It's like an old wives tale that, oh, bologna is expensive. It's more expensive than uh, New York steak. You know, it's, it's $25 a pound or whatever, but on a sandwich price per sandwich basis, it's the cheapest sandwich almost year in and year out that you can make 33 cents a sandwich this year. Another year has gone by, by the way, and I still haven't had fried bologna. Oh, you have got to be kidding. Another, <laughs> how many years in a row have and we talked you, about that? How many years have you promised you're going to have a fried bologna so, sandwich? I, I think you've promised that every year for the last five years. I am such a liar, apparently. <laughs> I don't mean to be a liar. I just, every time I go near bologna, Cheryl's like, no, nah, yeah. One of my daughter, Nina, it's one of her favorite sandwiches. I love bologna. bologna, but apparently it's packed with salt and uh, yeah. Hey, and you can't eat, they're like lace, but you can't eat just one either. You, oh yeah, God, yeah so you can't. Well, there's a flaw in your study right there. You've only got one piece of bologna on the sandwich. <laughs> that's that's the flaw. We found it. Now we're done. And then- uh, uh, Hey, don't stir up your listeners, Joe. <laughs> I, you know, we don't need any more nasty grams. <laughs> Two of these. Well, let's talk about a nasty gram because uh, what was the next most expensive? So that's 33 cents for a bologna sandwich. Yeah. Uh, next- this year, American cheese weaseled its way in to tie peanut butter and jelly at 40 cents a sandwich. Well, you know why? Because it's borderline child abuse to serve that stuff to anybody. <laughs> That's exactly why, according to a listener <laughs> or a former listener, probably. Yeah, I apologize, Joe. We're gonna, I just can't wait to see who's going to complain this year. We're going to beat that horse <laughs> just over and over. Uh, but PB&J, it's funny because PB&J is a quality sandwich. I mean- you know, you get the peanut butter, you get the jelly, you get uh, you get a little variety there. <laughs> hey, it's, I love peanut butter and jelly. I mean, who doesn't love? Hey, you want to you want to vary it? Put a banana on there, and it's oh. not going to raise the price that much either. I mean, you can get bananas for what ten, fifteen cents a banana. I mean, how many slices of banana can you put on a sandwich? You could probably get uh, two or three sandwiches worth of banana on. Uh, you know, three sandwiches from one banana. So yeah, it's a it's a great sandwich. Price of jelly and price of peanut butter both went up this year, but still, just to show you, uh, peanut butter went up twenty percent. Oh, this year. so jelly not a ton then. Well, or the jelly went up uh, about eight uh, percent. What what happened? Did the price of bread go down? Yes, it did. You got it, Joe. Very good. Yep, that's the first year in a while that the price of bread has actually dropped, and the price of bread dropped. Uh, let me look. Twenty three percent. The price of holy bread moly. Yep. So that's what made the difference. I wonder if the slices are 23% smaller. I mean, I don't, I don't <laughs> who knows? Uh, next, next up in uh, fourth, you've got egg salad and we're all the way up to 56 cents. Boy, there's a big difference here at the, at the bottom, 33 cents, 40 cents. Then you rock it up to 56 with egg salad, egg salad going the wrong way by 8%. Yeah. And that has to do mainly with the price of eggs. Now I will say this. This price survey was done in California. California seems to have some wildly swinging prices on eggs. We had a, a terrible egg shortage a couple of years ago, if you remember, and the eggs went up. Oh, my God. It, it was so expensive. I can't even remember what it was anymore, but it was ridiculous, like four bucks for a, a dozen eggs or something like that. The prices dropped, went back to normal last year, and now they've kind of inched their way up just a little bit this year. But still, if you think about it, 56 cents a sandwich for an egg salad, not too bad. Not too bad. No, no, really. Uh, that, that'll still get on the McDonald's dollar menu, right? right I mean, that beats right, anything right. on the McDonald's dollar right, menu. Absolutely. And everybody thinks that's a bargain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Turkey and Swiss is next. That's a quality sandwich at 62 
sense. And of course, we talked about that. That's a big mover down 26%. Yeah, that's a big mover. And again, I will, in 2015, that same sandwich was $1.44. Really? I'm, yeah, that's what I was, I'm, I'm telling you, I do not know what is going on, but in the last two years, the price has fallen. It fell 42% uh, last year. It fell another, what, 37% this year. So we're down to a dollar four, or we're down to 62 cents wow. from a dollar 44. So get your turkey in Swiss because it's low, yeah. baby. Buy low. Buy low. Turkey lovers, it's this is the time to enjoy those turkey sandwiches. Uh, salami at 76% uh, went yeah. down 3%. That's with mustard. With mustard, yes. Yeah, and then ham and Swiss uh, with mustard and mayonnaise up 6%. Uh, that's at 91 cents. And still under a buck, right? We're still under right. a buck. So we've gone through seven sandwiches now, and we're still under a buck. This is the first time, Joe, since 2010, I'm sorry, 2011, so seven, six years ago, that we've had seven sandwiches in the survey under a buck. Wow. That yes. is that is big. And, and yeah. you're, I mean, you're making this compelling case to take your lunch. Absolutely. Well, good. I hope so. Right. You save <laughs> mission, a lot of money. Mission accomplished. Number eight. Now we really jump again. 50 cents higher is a tuna salad. Of course, tuna price of tuna is going to be much higher than the price of ham. Yep. Yep. And like I said, these three, these next three sandwiches are kind of the royalty of sandwiches, in my yeah. opinion, right? The tuna, the roast beef is next, and then the BLT. Roast beef and cheddar warmed up. That's oh, the, yeah. For the win. Love it. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> and then the BLT at 289. Anything else here? So when you put together the sandwich along with a couple other items, let's say, you know, a little bag of chips and maybe a fruit cup or a, a couple slices of celery, carrots, that type of thing, you're mm-hmm. still probably under three bucks. Oh, you're under, you're definitely under three bucks, Joe. And, and this year I didn't, normally I, I price those things out individually, but I didn't this year, but it's always, I guarantee you it's far less than what your kids are going to spend at, at a high school or certainly what listeners are going to listen, uh, going to spend when they go to work and they eat out. There's a lot more in this survey, and you know what? We're going to give people the link. If you just go to lenpenzo.com, you'll find the entire survey with a bunch of advice that crazy Mr. Penzo here gives about uh, how to make the cost of these maybe even less expensive. Like I'm looking at five or six different pieces of advice here. We'll let people uh, we'll let people go to the site to get all that. We'll also have the link on our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Len Penzo, awesome. thanks for hanging out again, man. Joe, it's always a pleasure to be with you in the basement. Hey, trivia fans, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and with all of the sandwich talk around here, let's meet all of your sandwich expectations and jump into the trivia. Everyone knows Jerome Smuckers, right? The founder of the Smuckers brand, sells jam, preserves, jelly beans. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Here's the question. Which American icon planted the trees that supplied Jerome Smuckers the first apples for Smuckers Mill? I'll have the answer for you right after the break. Hey, stackers, we get used to those same daily routines, don't we? Wake up at the same time every morning, brush our teeth, park the car in the same spot at work every day, recite jokes in the mirror to be funnier than that jerk of the water cooler. Or is that what just me? Here's one thing you shouldn't make routine, using the same credit card from the same bank just because that's what you've always done. Nick Clements from Magnify Money explains why. I mean, it's never been a better time, honestly, to find a a credit card, especially given the lucrative sign-on bonuses that are out there. Uh, Chase just recently had 100000 on, on their reserve card. I, I think we're at a point right now where credit cards are, are extremely profitable for large banks um, and they are really wanting to get more customers. And so they're, they're rolling out the red carpet. So I would just say if, you're, you, if you have had a credit card for more than two or three years, chances are there's a much better deal out there for you today. So why stick with that same old card with those rewards that haven't changed in years? You can use MagnifyMoney.com to always find best in class, including better interest rates. And don't only use Magnify Money for credit cards. Nick and the team have built the site from the ground up to help with personal loans, student loans, and mortgages. Average person saves $450 in interest when they hit stackcubedgements.com forward slash Magnify Money. Here's a question. What's keeping you away from investing in real estate? Over my career, I repeatedly hear that time, you know, the time it takes to find renters, property managers, and to fix problems and stress. What if you don't find a good property manager? What if you don't find a renter? Those are two of the biggest factors keeping people away from investing in real estate. We talked to Gary Beasley, CEO of Roofstock, about how the team at Roofstock are helping you take back a good night's sleep. 
The biggest pain point I have found is management. When you buy properties, you don't want to get calls about the tenant having a clogged toilet in the middle of the night. We solve that by finding third-party managers in each market who handle all the details for you. How's that for an advantage? Roofstock's online marketplace makes it easier than ever to buy, sell, and own tenant-occupied investment properties in top rental markets across the country. You own the house, but Roofstock handles as much or as little of the headache-inducing issues that you've come to expect with renting, but that doesn't have to happen if you partner with the right team. Best of all, Roofstock certified properties are backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. Check them out at stackybedjamins.com forward slash Roofstock. That's stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Roofstock. Welcome, sandwich lovers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I just scored the best grilled cheese from Joe's mom. More on that later, but let's get to your trivia answer first. Before the break, I asked you this question. Which American icon planted the trees that supplied Jerome Smuckers the first apples for Smuckers Mill? The answer? Len Penzo. <laughs> I'm just kidding, it's Johnny Appleseed. Smuckers collected his first apples from the mill in the year 1897 from trees planted by Johnny Appleseed himself. Now there's something to impress your friends with today at the water cooler, huh? See ya. Johnny Appleseed. Okay, that was a little bit of a trick question. What do you mean it was a trick question? Because Johnny Appleseed was, this is like the 1700s. There are trees he planted, maybe. I mean. He supplied the apples. He was dead. The trees that he planted 200 years earlier supplied the apples. A hundred and something years. But anyway. I, I, I'm I, rounding. I get what you're saying. You're still wrong and you're just bitter. Well, I'm just, I kind of feel taken advantage of. Because I was thinking like, who owned the ranch that owned the apple farm? Yeah. Find that out. Bet it was the right one. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's or rather life insurance's most important questions. You know, our friends over at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they're disrupting the life insurance industry by focusing on what you value most. What do you value? What two sandwiches do you value most, OG? Oh, man. I love me a good roast beef sandwich with the uh, roast beef and cheddar, horseradish sauce on there, maybe a tomato. Mm. So that's kind of a go to for me. And then if I'm feeling frisky, maybe like a panini. Wow. You know, like a hot sandwich. Wow. Like a hot pocket. <laughs> <laughs> maybe something just a step above a hot pocket. Maybe just yeah. a little bit more. But when it comes to insurance, of course, you value your family and your time, not sitting around worrying about, uh, am I going to get the life insurance and how long is this process going to take? That's why they've created a high quality, affordable term life insurance policy issued by Mass Mutual that you can purchase entirely online. And by entirely, I mean entirely. Also, qualified healthy applicants can skip the medical exam. Head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free quote and learn about life insurance the modern way. That's stackybedjamins.com forward slash Haven Life. Uh, today, we're going to throw off Haven Lifeline to our new friend, Phil. Hey, Joe and OG. My name is Phil. I'm 31 years old and a teacher, and I'm currently at a uh, teacher conference in Pennsylvania. And was debating with a dinner table the advantages of a Roth versus a traditional 403B plan. I'm a millennial, and as such, we tend to be arrogant about such things when we're pretty sure about it. But I'm actually, after saying what I said, I'm questioning whether or not I'm correct. I felt that a traditional 403B, 401k, what have you, would be always an advantage because the money that would have been taxed goes into the 403B. And that if you do the pre-tax option with the Roth, if you're doing this over the long term, you would effectively be putting less money to compound in over the long run. So I guess my question is, what's really the difference between the traditional and the Roth in terms of the long-term compounding gains that you might have in the long run? All right. Help a millennial out. See ya. Hey, Phil, thanks for the question. By the way, this is the raging discussion in our Facebook group also right now, OG. It is the the biggest discussion. And I can't Boy, wait. I'll tell you what, I am not interested, <coughs> Phil, in attending a dinner party with you. <laughs> no, <laughs> so. no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said he was having this discussion with the dinner table, and I was going to tell him he should maybe try talking to people. <laughs> 
<laughs> Boy. That, <laughs> Almost uh, as bad as your total eclipse of the heart yeah, right there. Total eclipse of the heart. All right, what do we got for him? Here's the way that I think about it. We can sit down and do math all day long and calculate it as well. But if you put $100 into your pre-tax 403B, right? You're not paying taxes on it right now. And that $100 grows to a million dollars. Now you have to pay taxes on the million. What's well, subjected to those income taxes when you withdraw them. So in some function, the 401k or the traditional way of doing it is a form of how much you take out, right? You could say, well, I'm only going to take out $1,500 a year. And so therefore I'm going to be under such and such a tax bracket. So that I'm going to be lower. The Roth, you're right. You don't get any tax breaks for putting the money in, but it grows tax deferred. And when you go to take it out, it's hundred percent tax free. And there's also no restrictions on when you have to withdraw them. So one of the biggest differences is kind of fast forwarding 40 years. You're 31 right now, Phil. So think of when you're 71, hard to imagine, I know, but at 71, you'll be required to take money out of your 403B, the traditional side, even if you don't need the money, which means you're required to pay income taxes, even if you don't need the money. Whereas a Roth, you don't have to do that. If you have a spouse or a child that inherits your 403B on the traditional side, they'll be required to take money out. On the child, they're required to take the money out or your your inheritor would be required to take the money out, but there's no taxes. So I'm a big fan of having the most decisions later, kind of in the decision tree, so to speak. I'm not entirely sure that there is going to come down to a really specific, here's the exact right answer, because first of all, everybody's situation is a little bit different. But notwithstanding that, the big variable that nobody knows is what tax rates are going to look like in the future, right? I mean, if you are making $20,000 a year right now, but your retirement plan is for you to earn $200,000 a year in retirement, well, it's pretty clear that you're going to be in a higher tax bracket in the future. So I'd want that to be kind of tax-free money. If you make an 80000 and your projected retirement income is 80000 you're in the same tax bracket, give or take, right? But the thing we don't know is, what does that look like 30 years from now? Are tax rates twice as much? Are they half as much? Are they kind of the same? Do they index the numbers with inflation? So, you know, as, as time goes on, we kind of stay where we are, so to speak. And that's really why we advocate doing with the information that you have right now, making the decision with the information that you have right now. So, for example, if you're close to a tax bracket and you can contribute money to your pre-tax 403B to stay in the 15% bracket as opposed to jumping to the 25, then that's what I would do, right? I would say, well, I'm going to take that $5,000 off the table so it's not taxed at 25% right now. If you're right smack dab in the middle of one, I put it in the Roth because you have the most flexibility. And to your point about, well, technically then you would have less money to put in. I guess if you were really analyzing it, that's kind of true, but that's not what happens in real life. So we, you know, we got to deal with real life things here. The real life piece is the part of this argument that gets to me in the discussion that uh, they're having in the closed Facebook group is really, it's all about the math piece. And the math, I agree, largely says what Phil says, which is most of the time, the pre-tax is better. Oh, gee, you just went over brilliantly the math, so I'm not going to rehash that. But, but, But in real life, two things. Number one is often, way more than I wanted to, I would have people come into my office and say, I screwed up. I'm pre 59 and a half. I want to get to my money. Uh, I want to get to my money early. So what hurdles can I jump through to try to get this money that's in the pre-tax position earlier than I'm really allowed? And of course, there are ways to do that, but they're complicated. They're not fun. And if we had just had some flexibility with our money, if we had just put stuff in a little bit more flexible place, we wouldn't have to jump through all those hoops. And number two, the economic impact of flexibility versus putting all your money into the pre-tax position or into one that is the right one. You know, let's say everything OG, let's say everything goes exactly the right way. You didn't need any flexibility and the math was what made sense the most, right? If that's the case, what's the value in terms of spending power and in terms of life changes to the way that you would have spent your retirement years? 
I don't think it's significant. So for me, well, it's not. I mean, if you're looking at it and say, I can put a thousand a month and not pay taxes, or I have to pay taxes on the thousand, so I can only put seven fifty a month. The outcome, the trajectory ends up being exactly the same in the future. You have twenty five percent more, but you have to pay taxes on it, and now you have twenty five percent less, but it's tax free. It's the same. It's the net number. But to your point, it's about having choices in the future, right? It's about having the flexibility to go. I'm going to pull the ripcord at 54. I feel like we're spending a lot of time on a tree and we're not looking at the damn forest, right? Yeah. We have this big forest of an issue and we're looking at a single tree going, "Ah, I got to get the right tax treatment on this. (laughs) Yeah. The the $1 for forget it for flip and get it. It is so, so, so the 15th dragon, which is why I've stayed out of it because that's what, because that's what I want to say. And I want to be a nice guy in our Facebook group. I don't, I just don't want to get involved. I'm like, oh my, why are we fighting over this little leaf on this little tree? It is so not the issue. It's so not the issue. So sorry, I got a little feisty there. And by the way, Phil, that's not that it's, I mean, it wasn't a bad question to ask. It's a, hey, you know, mathematically, which pre-tax most of the time, most of the big asset houses have uh, calculators where based on your age, you can do some of the math there too on their calculators. Our friend Brandon, the mad scientist, who has a calculator for everything, he's 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 got he's got uh, some great stuff on his site over at the mad scientist. So you know, and there's ways to optimize this, right? I mean, like if you're if you're really looking at it, you can play that game. I just don't think it's necessary. I don't think so either, because it boils down to <laughs> it's not your tax treatment of the dollars; it's the fact that you saved five hundred dollars too little every month for the last 30 years. Yeah. And it's not that we shouldn't use a tax shelter, right? It's not that we shouldn't. We totally should, but come on. Uh, All right. (laughs) If you've got a question. Now Joe's a little feisty. Joe's the feisty one now. I I just, and I'm sorry, Phil, this particular argument that I've seen, just, it just, mm, the whole thing you said, OG, about real life. We can do the math all day, but real life is way different than the way the math looks. And it's funny because you don't know that until you've experienced it. And the place where I feel like you and I have been a little bit lucky here, we have been able to see, you know, I worked with maybe 200 families, right? So over the course of my career, I probably have worked with maybe 400, 450 families. I got to see larger numbers than just one person. I got to see lots of people retire. I got to see lots of people put their kids through college. I got to see all this stuff that the normal person gets to see one time. And because of that, I think I have a little bit different viewpoint about about, about some of these yeah. silly arguments that we have about irrelevant, just irrelevant, irrelevant. Bam. Tell us how you really feel. Stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. If you'd like me to yell at you next. <laughs> <laughs> I, t- I feel bad. I do feel bad, but, uh, but feel fantastic. Uh, actually fantastic. I thought he was going to say, I'm at this teacher conference trying to figure out a way. Not to be. Not to be. Yeah. I, I'm wondering if you, one of you guys could come pick me up and get me the hell out of here. Uh, that's funny. Uh, we also get letters down here in the basement and Doug brings down the mail and he just brought us a great one from Wyatt. Wyatt says, I've recently been relocated within my company to a new location. I think when you get relocated, that means... That's exactly what happened. You go to a new location, doesn't it? Right. From the Department of the Redundancy Department. (laughs) Because of the the relocation, I'm getting a cost of living bump in salary. This bump's in the form of a lump sum amount my first paycheck in my new location. I do have some debt that I'd like to pay off first, but after that, I should have about 15,000 bucks left. My biweekly salary will also increase. I'm going from about 82000 to 87000 a year. What would be your suggestion on what I should do with this money? I plan on renting to start out, but maybe open to buying if the price is right. I also have a home where I currently live that I'm about to put on the market. Love the show, and I'm glad I've been able to get great advice from you all from afar. Thanks, Wyatt. That's really cool. So okay. he's so he's got fifteen grand, and he also has a $5,000 bump in salary. Cool. Pay off the debt, build your cash reserve, take two of these and call us in the morning. What about the house? How does he make the house decision? Yeah, uh, I'm not, I've moved just once in my life from our kind of original home to, to the new place we live now. And I'm so happy that we lived in such a crappy apartment for a year and a half because we found a great house at a great price in the great neighborhood that we wanted to live in. 
And I feel like if we would have kind of bought a house right away, solely concentrating on, hey, if I can find a good deal, I might jump on it. I feel like maybe we wouldn't be here, but, you know, we would be somewhere else. And I'm sure it would be fine to live somewhere else, too. But because we rented for a while and got used to the traffic patterns and got used to where the grocery store was and, you know, I like to drive this direction, but not that direction at this time of day or night, you know, that kind of helps you figure out which, which area to live in. So I, I like the idea of renting for a while and seeing what happens. And if you profit from the sale of your house where you are right now, you know, I would just leave that in cash. That'll be your down payment for the next house. And I think that a lot of that house decision, why it has to do with how long you think you're going to be in that area, you know? Well, I mean, sure. Yeah. That's really the biggest piece. Yeah. Uh, because short term, the, the, the cost of uh, the real estate transaction Pretty, pretty high. It always amazes me, by the way, that people are so analytical. Listen to me now. I'm going after this one. People are so analytical about the, the transaction cost on a mutual fund. But when it comes to your house, we accept this huge, huge price that we pay every time we buy and sell a house, right? Like, what if it was like a vanguard of like the housing world? And, and you I need know, to write my uh, senator consumer finance protection bureau and tell them that i'm you know maybe the white house can author a report of the cost of conflicted advice in real estate transactions (laughs) you know it's completely there's there's no conflicting advice there at all no not at all you know well that the whole department of labor ruling came off this report that said it costs taxpayers 17 billion dollars you know because my mutual fund fee is 0.7 instead of 0.4 and there's uh there's but um but yeah, I can it really I'm going to get ticked off at Schwab because they charge me four dollars and ninety five cents to buy my 10 shares of Apple stock this afternoon. But uh, but I'm gladly going to give give somebody who put my house on the Internet for me, which, by the way, you can do on your own now. I'm going to gladly give them twenty four thousand dollars for my four hundred thousand dollar <laughs> house purchase. And then I'm going to give the bank another ten thousand dollars in closing costs. <laughs> And I have to get a credit report fee for $125. And by the way, and by the way, there's great real estate professionals out there. Phenomenal realtors. There's great. We're actually, people think that we're bitching about real estate fees. If you're, Uh, if if you're in the real estate business, we're not complaining about your fee. We're just complaining about the double standard. That's all we're complaining about. I'm not saying real estate people are paid too much. And I know people are going to write in and go, but you can sell it yourself on FISBO and on uh, Redfin and, you know, all that. Sort of, I got all that. I, 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 I got I'm it. not buying another house any time in my life. So I'm going to die fun. in this thing right here. Yeah. Why it's going to take me till I die to pay it off anyway. So Yeah. So we get off our rant here for a second. I just think that, uh, Wyatt, you got to look at how long you're going to be there before you uh, do it, which is another reason maybe to have the crappy apartment like you were talking about, OG. You know, just you get to know the area. You also know, you know, if White has kids, what the good school district is, you know, the the uh, lay of the land, how close it's you likely are. likely a little less expensive, so you can save a little bit more versus the house. You certainly, you know, I've had five things break in my house in the last week. Each thing costs a thousand bucks to fix. Of course it you did. Know. Yeah. You know, it's just, it just is, that's just how life goes. So rent for sure. And and if you've got the cash reserve, we didn't answer this question. He didn't ask it, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you got the cash reserve and you've got the debt paid off and you got the money set aside for the house from your other transaction, you know, go Roth, Roth IRA, um, bump up your 401k contributions, Ta-da. all sorts of stuff you can do with your pay raise. Good stuff. The big thing to do with that pay raise though, is unless you want lifestyle inflation, which, you know, there's nothing wrong with inflating your lifestyle and saying, Hey, I've got $5,000 more. I want to spend it. Good for you. That's fine. But if you don't want that to happen, and most people suffer from lifestyle inflation just because they're not paying attention, right? Yep. Uh, what I like doing is take that 5000 at the very least and hide it in, you know, open up an M1 finance account, open up that and get the money saved into one of those M1 finance pies and just do that until you decide how you want the budget to change. Capture the money. Agree. One hundred percent. Yep. Good stuff. So if you've got a letter for the show, go to stackybenjamins.com. You'll see questions. We'll throw out the Haven lifeline to you, which is always the quickest way to get on, or we can answer your letter. And we had a great letters episode on Monday and uh, man, we're, we're, we're fairly close. We're running just a couple of weeks uh, to get your letter on right now. So stackybenjamins.com and you'll see across the top questions for the show. 
Big thanks to everybody, by the way, who also left us a review. You know, reviews are kind of the lifeblood. They tell people what what they're getting into when they listen to the Stacking Benjamin show. And it's fantastic that uh, that so many people have taken the time to do that. We've had lots of reviews lately going on to Mom's Fridge. Let me give you a couple here. Five stars, says Stacking Benjamins from NBC Lloyd. Love the show. The personalities of the host are so fun. Thanks for the work. Exclamation point. Thanks, NBC Lloyd. Also, this one from Lapinek, L-A-P-I-N-E-Q. Is that what it is? A Lapin EQ? I don't know. A favorite podcast, five stars. Have you ever wanted to sit around with friends judging Johnny Depp's spending habits while you're at work or doing the dishes or playing solitaire? Well, this show's for you. One of my favorite parts of the day is whenever I find time to put on headphones and descend into the basement. Haven't learned anything, but the $100 bills lying around my house have mysteriously begun to pile up. Easily my favorite podcast. Thank you to cast and crew for all the hard work that makes happen. Every time there's an extra interesting episode like the 500th anniversary or the recent interview with the lady who had $50,000 stolen, I want to send you all a gold star. Man, that was the $50,000 mm, that Shannon yeah, Allen had. Oh, yeah. So bad. So horrible. Uh, thank you. I'm going to call them Lappin EQ for the very kind review. If you can leave us a review wherever you listen, that helps people understand a lot more about the Stacking Benjamin Show. And if you need somebody in your corner helping you with your financial planning, guess what? OG's taking clients. And to find out what it would take to have him in your corner, here's where you go. StackingBenjamins.com forward slash OG. That's just the letter O and the letter G. StackingBenjamins.com forward slash OG. That'll lead you to his calendar for a virtual meeting where you'll talk to him about uh, exactly what you're looking for. He could tell you more there. That's going to do it, man. You're done for the week. I'm working on Friday. Great roundtable on Friday. We've got Rob Wilson joining us. He's Hip Hop's financial advisor, uh, works with pro football players, NBA stars, hip hop stars. Uh, Rob Wilson is going to be on our round table along with Paula and Len, Len back for an encore. Len, Len's on twice this week on Friday. And then in the middle of the show, check this out. This is pretty cool. You know, we do our fintech segments on Fridays. I've always wondered myself why car insurance couldn't be easier. What if you could use the camera on your phone to just take a picture and bam, get an insurance quote and see if it beats what you've got? Well, an insurance company called Go. Uh, Kevin from Go is uh, going to join us and uh, tell us a lot about Go in the middle of the show. Another cool fintech company. We don't endorse these companies, just some interesting stuff that we found that we'd like to pass on to you to hear about. And then you can do your due diligence. All right. That's Friday. But for now, guys, go stack some Benjamins. Doug, what should we have learned today? I got this, Joe. I got it. Go back to your nap. First, wondering about ways to make a little extra money? Check the calendar. Maybe there's a big event coming to your area and you can find a way to cash in. Second, worried about whether to use the Roth or traditional option in your plan? Well, there's lots of math you can do. Focus on the big picture first. Doing something is better than being paralyzed and doing nothing at all. But the big lesson? Don't ever try to pull a practical joke on Joe by adding hot peppers to his sandwich because he'll just throw wasabi inside your pudding later. All right, Joe, that's the last time I'm getting jalapeno business. God, that was a long setup for, for that? Jesus, Joe, you got to get back on your writing game. This comedy sucks. Special thanks to Len Penzo. You can find his sandwich survey and his blog at the aptly named lenpenzo.com. But if that's too hard for you, you can always find a link to Lynn on our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Kathleen Selmans handles design, newsletter, and classroom opportunities. If you'd like to learn more, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash classes. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru, and I'm Joe's mom, Saber Doug, reminding you to send me money. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. 
And before we go, I have this message from Stacking Benjamin's Management. Joe and Len mentioned a review from a listener who said that the hosts of the show recommended a cheese sandwich, which was borderline abuse. Please try and remember, when listening to the Stacking Benjamins podcast, that we refuse to stand for anything. Ever. Thank you. I went to see a movie that I know you're excited about, OG. Can't wait to hear it. This film stars Regina Hall, Tiffany Haddish, Jada Pickett-Smith, and Queen Latifah. This is Girls Trip. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this day of life. My heart is so full of joy for these women right here. Lord, please make sure that Lisa don't get an STD and that nobody has kidney failure because we finna get messed up and let me get pregnant by somebody rich. That's all I ask. Amen. We haven't hung in five years. I miss you guys. We need a girl's trip. That's my car. Not anymore, baby. What if I just whip out my t's, you know? Okay, a t- I'll take a t- for a bike ride. You sure you want to get turned this weekend with your girls? I say this out of love. Preach, girl. Mm. If you are going to come along with us, please refrain from saying things like preach or go girl or any other colloquialisms that you may have looked up on Urban Dictionary. Girl, bye. That's my girl. This weekend is about us. We deserve this. So let's go. We deserve this, OG, so let's go. Let's take a. We, we deserve a girl's trip. But we do. You deserve, and me. We do deserve a girl's trip. So this is a story about four longtime friends that uh, used to hang out together all the time. Of course, their lives have drifted apart, and now they decide to get back together in New Orleans. Uh, the Regina Hall character, she is giving a speech, and so she brings along three of her friends to this conference that she's going to, and uh, hilarity ensues. This is uh, if you've ever seen movies like The Hangover or. What's the uh, what's the bachelorette party movie with Kristen Wiig? Bridesmaids. Yeah, Bridesmaids. Got it. If you've ever seen either of those movies, this is a movie in the same vein as those uh, films. And you, and you know what? In terms of laughs, there's a ton of laughs. I'll tell you, while I really like Bridesmaids, the first hangover I thought was pretty funny. The second hangover I thought was awful. You know what, OG? This movie was disgusting. It was, it was filthy. It was just, it was a, there were so many times during this film where I just went, oh, and, and, you know, I mean, I'm the guy that did the review of my dad wrote a porno. So I get filthy. And That's dis- what I forgot. That's what I forgot to listen to. I was on a pretty long car ride a couple of weeks ago and I was trying to think of stuff to listen to and I forgot about that one. So uh, the first five episodes of that are hilarious, but you know what? After five episodes, when I reviewed it, I got to episode six and I haven't gone, I've maybe listened to six and seven, but I've slowed down a lot because now it's just the same stuff. It's just the dad writes disgusting, filthy stuff and they make fun of it and how badly written it is and how gross it is. And you know, you get some, but now it's just like they're beating the same thing. And this, this movie kept doing that over and over and over. There's a scene that actually I cut the trailer right there at the one minute mark where uh, Jada Pinkett Smith has to, she says, she says, I got to pee and they're getting on a zip line going over uh, bourbon street and she gets stuck halfway. And they did something where they put a hose between her legs and she pees on everybody underneath them. And then another woman does nice. this, and then, potty, uh, potty humor. And That's then another classy. woman does the same thing. Well, if, at first it was kind of, it was kind of funny, but then it was just, there was even more of it and more of it, more of it. And then one of the four women is uh, demonstrating 
something that she likes to do with men. And she takes a grapefruit and she puts it over a banana to show it. And then she does it. And, um, and it's kind of funny, but it also like they, they continued the joke with a real dude later on. And it just, it's just what kind of movie is this? I know. I know it was, I, I thought I thought it was pretty fun. It got an 87% Rotten Tomato score. I get it. I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, for me, kind of a thumb down. I got done. I feel like I wasted a couple hours. And, you know, I have friends that went to see it and thought that it was hilarious. I get it. Just, uh, just yeah, not, not, not for me. Next up on Joe's review, Emoji Movie. I, I'm not going to see the Emoji Movie. <laughs> That's not. I am... I am later today going to go see Detroit. So yeah. I like uh, Catherine Bigelow. She's the director of the movie and she did Zero Dark Thirty and The Hurt Locker, which are movies I really liked. Uh, right. So I'm excited about seeing Detroit. Of course, Detroit being, you know, my town. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about uh, seeing what they're going to do with Detroit. So we'll have a review of that pretty soon. But for now, you see anything lately? No, I listened to a lot of podcasts from when I was on the road. How I built this is a really good show. I know yeah. you've talked about that before. Well, we are for the um, for the podcast Academy Awards that are coming up in a couple of weeks. We are up against that show for best. Well, then don't go watch for, for the, best listen business to them. podcast. Tell, yeah, write everybody and tell them it sucks. <laughs> right, it is a great show. But no, it's really good. The host is really good. Yeah, you can tell he's an NPR guy, right? Yes, he's uh, he's pretty smooth in his delivery. But um, but the stories are pretty pretty good. And they're everything I hope they would be for billionaires, right? It's not like, well, you know, I was born and then daddy gave me a Amex card and now I'm a gazillionaire. It's, you know, they're all like, yeah, I just wanted to make a cheeseburger one day and everybody liked them. So then I, I didn't, gave them to my buddies. I started listening to that when the five guys, dude, that's yeah. the five guys, dude. Yeah. Uh, the Tom's founder, I found... I thought was very interesting that he's a serial entrepreneur. And what I liked about his story was that he realized, he realizes now that those failures are the reason he kept going. You know, he, he kept going because he had failure after failure. And uh, he said, you know, if, if one of these would have been moderately successful, one of these things early on, he wouldn't have been as driven to go. And yeah. now with Tom's, of course, he's made bajillion dollars. And then a woman uh, who created the company, it's like baby. Did you, did you hear the one with the baby blankets? Mm -hmm. She makes baby blankets. And uh, of course, uh, uh, William and Kate were video once with their baby and her blanket and like sales just went through the roof. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but, but the her, Oprah effect. Yeah. Her story of uh, having a partner and it just went badly and, um, you know, and struggling and mortgaging pretty much everything. Just a phenomenal story. How I built this pretty great podcast. I've been watching Madam Secretary season three. I don't know how long it's been out. It's probably been out a while now, but I just noticed that there's a new season. I really like that show, man. Uh, yeah. One of the few shows that we get into the third season, I'm still watching, mm. you know, usually I watch a season, maybe two, and then I get tired because it's kind of the formula, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm halfway through um, Last Chance You, season two. Nothing really explosive yet. No. The first season was very explosive, every yeah, episode. See, that's what I think about seasons, you know, d upcoming. One of the few shows that I've seen that I thought got better over time was Chef's Table. You know, that documentary Chef's Table. I feel like they're hitting like the highlights of what people really want to see from these chefs and what they don't well, want to see. The funny thing on this, on this Last Chance You is... This guy's a football coach, right? He cusses, he cusses out his players. He's he's intense, right? He's a great dad. He's at home with his family, video tape, you know, and he's eating dinner and and then he's on the football field and he's he's a little over the top, right? Like his That's what you said. Mannerisms were pretty right. bad. He assaulted an official, which is a big no-no verbally for sure. And at the beginning of the season two, he's like, hey, I watched myself on the Internet and I didn't like who I saw. So now I'm not going to do that anymore. And it's and it really like took the air out of everything, <laughs> like because, you know, that he's like. I haven't watched the whole season, but I'm thinking he's going to explode. 
going to happen. Like that, that pressure valve needs a release every so often. And I'm having a, I think he's just going to have an aneurysm or something because he's not letting it out. And the team's not very good this year. They got really good players, but they're just not playing as a team so far. And um, so uh, anyway, so I'll watch the rest of it because I like to complete things. But, because you will, right. But um, anyway. Yeah, good stuff. All right, we are running long, so let's uh, let's see everybody on Friday. Bye-bye.